getting the material out of these school pools, uh, there, it would be a, to avoid a problem like the issue of AG Unit 4, which is an old fuel assembly pool, there's nothing in the reactor, and still the thing exploded. Um, we've got to get the fuel out of the fuel pools. And so our first priority has got to be to get it to dry gas. And on Yaka, Yaka was, you know, it was not, it was, it was chosen politically despite the science. And so people will say, well, you know, this is this is a political thing and actually the science supports you. No, it was the other way around. Yep, no. the, the bill was originally called the, the you use the blight term, screw in the bottom. And um, so Yucca may not be the right one. Some, somebody's got to take it sometime. But first, you got to stop taking it. I just wanted to talk about the last time I heard Jeff Patterson speak, he talked a lot about Alice Stewart, who was the person who did the original research on low-level radiation and its effect on the human body. And um, she said, uh, I read a little bit of some of the things she said, and one of them was that if a pregnant woman gets a, ch uh, not a chest x-ray, a tooth x-ray, that uh, there's a certain percentage higher rate of leukemia in, her, in the offspring of a woman who has this while she's pregnant. And, uh, but I just wanted to put out the name Alice Stewart to answer some of the questions about the effects of low-level radiation on the human body. I Googled it, and it worked. You can find it. Yeah, you can find Alice Stewart's work in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and uh, we, the archives are on Google Books, if you want to. Oh, just, uh, my name is Cindy. Just to follow up on that, there's a book called The Woman Who Knew Too Much that was written about Alice Stewart. It's a whole lot. It's fantastic. Uh, I just want to mention that we've been talking about accidents. We haven't talked about waste accidents starting way back in the Chalk River. Uh, and then with Winscale in England, it was so critical. This plant blew up. The top. It was like a mini Chernobyl. All the milk and vegetables had to... Yeah, but it blew up. Yes. But then it was so bad that... The, when they started reprocessing, which is one of the dirtiest places in the whole world, and it hasn't been mentioned much to once today, Sellafield, uh, which is making a reprocessing, uh, they had to change the name from Winscale to Sellafield. It's the same place. Because they, they, they're very good at name changing when you have an accident. Not to mention in 1957, Kristen, there have been three huge accidents in Euro Russia. I can't pronounce it very well, but one they had all the waste in a lake, and the lake dried up, and all kinds of just, there were three of them, not just one. Nuclear waste accidents, not to mention Laguna down in Veracruz, Mexico, where they have snoops on the beach, and they're very bad in third world countries, because they just dump the waste on the beach. I could go on and on, I think we have to realize the seriousness of keeping this waste in the future. And one question, what's the name of the plant that's going to shut down this year? Kiwani. The, the Kiwani plant in Wisconsin, is, uh, it's, it's a 600 megawatt plant, it's a single unit plant, and uh, the, the owner of the plant has decided that uh, uh, it makes no economic sense to run it, so we should be down. Uh, We've said that on a couple of the latest experiments podcasts, we talked about that, that there, the dominoes are starting to fall. These small single unit reactors like Oyster Creek, um, Vermont Yankee, and, and others, the commercial pressure is on them to keep them running, especially in light of Fukushima modifications. Uh, I don't think Kiwani will be the only plant to shut down. I think we'll see. Also, I'd like to add that Canada, the Quebec's only reactor, the Jean T, is shutting down by the end of 2012. That was a political decision made by the new French government. Mm -hmm. I'm Tim Coates from the state of Michigan, and I think that we should uh, at least address, I mean, as, as a peace loving person, we should at least address the fact that we are. we have to stop consuming so much. We have to demand more conservation of energy and not be lured and misled by the energy industry that we need more and more and more energy. Um, four years ago, I was somebody who mobilized along with uh, Dave Craft working with NEIS. 
uh, on the potential for argon being on a very short list for nuclear waste, uh, doing the research and development for nuclear waste reprocessing at Morris. And uh, I found it very effective to go to village hall, city councils, getting resolutions, explaining it to them, resolutions of opposition. We, we prefer HAPS if the choices that exist uh, versus transport. Uh, GNEP was the vehicle. And I know GNEP was zeroed out, but I also know that its name changed. And uh, the International Framework on Nuclear Energy Cooperation, I think, or something like that. And I Google it every now and then, notice that they still hold meetings. And uh, they're quite a following, because I think under Bush, 26 countries signed up and said, sell us reactors and we were to take the waste off their hands. So I think that, I don't know if this has been brought up in any of these discussions, but it's not just our waste. And I, I mean, it's everyone's, but if the politics are such that, obviously, the Bush administration stand on it was adopted or we would have done the same thing, uh, Obama, because I think five or six more countries joined on. There's something like 31 of them, and then they have observer countries that are in the 30s or 40s for signing up to this. Can you shed any light on this international framework and where things stand? I probably should turn to Steve Schwartz on this one. I'm not as well informed as I should be, but um, GNAP is not, yes, you're right, it's been zeroed out. I think, you know, there are continuing conversations though throughout the industry about how to meet energy needs. There is an international nuclear industry. And um, it, it, in this country, because of the market forces and the costs, um, there are very large pressures to uh, not build anymore. You know, it costs well, to $18 billion to build one. Small modular reactors are one solution to it. And in a way, I suppose that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, kind of remaining remnants from uh, GINA. But, um, but it, it continues to be an, an issue and, and it's, you know, I think there's some uh, progress, especially if we can close some of the older reactors here. But, uh, you know, unless we've got international partners on this, um, I think it's going to be a continuing, continuing issue. It still is, a, to some, an attractive way of going. Well, the partnership seems to be one side of it because we can take the West. Well, sure. the right. Well, again, we take the waste. Right. Exactly. Well, part of the issue is um, <laughs> we don't want to continue to promote weapons proliferation. So, if there is, um, you know, weapons-grade material or think enough radio, enough um, uranium coming from those that can be diverted or reprocessed in a way that would make for a weapon, we'd rather not do that. So. It's an international problem. Um, it's almost better that we take it back, frankly, than leave it there, in my view, uh, because I think we'll at least have the technology and it's for some of the countries more wealth to, to manage it. So we can ship it out, but it may come back to haunt us. I have a question that I don't believe pertains specifically to your expertise, but maybe someone else here can answer it. Um, over a year and a half ago, when Fukushima Daiichi uh, had this terrible disaster, uh, there was in the news, in the general media, reports occasionally about the extent of radiation fallout, both in the air and in the water. I haven't heard anything like that in over a year. And I have not seen any reports or any, even if any monitoring is going on to this day from that terrible incident. I know that, I, as I remember, there were uh, statements about the fact that our west coast was affected. I don't remember the severity of those uh, apparent reports of how affected it was uh, and how much of that radiation contamination has shifted towards the east, even as far as this area of the country. Is anyone monitoring? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of this information on the, on the Fairwind site, if you, if you, if you check. Um, I, um, I wrote a book on this, and it's a bestseller in Japan. So it's in Japanese, so it's not You know, when, when the accident happened, the day the accident happened, I knew there was a meltdown happening. 
And um, this is the fun, one of the fundamental turning points in my life. Uh, I had been an expert on Three Mile Island, and I saw my government cover up that accident. Um, radiation releases were probably something on the order of 10 to 100 times higher than what the NRC will still say. And, and so I, I turned to Maggie and I said, you know, I, I don't care what it takes. I'm not going to let it happen a second time. And that's really whether we put the videos up on the site and things like that. But, so they, the, but the issue is um, uh, the authorities, whether by AEA or the, or the Japanese government, have consistently underestimated the, uh, the radiation. I was in Tokyo in, uh, uh, in February. And um, I was, was on the on the boat tour, and I brought plastic bags with me. And every day I would walk outside and grab some dirt from where I was. And I ran this. I came back with the, the dirt, brought them through customs officially, and you have to declare it dirt when you bring it back, and then sent it to a lab. And all five bags would qualify as radioactive waste here in the country. And this was on the streets of so, Tokyo. Um, so. You know, what, what we would have to ship to Texas and, and store uh, by our standards in Tokyo was, uh, was ubiquitous. Um, the, the, um, I was there again in, in August, and I was over on, on Niigata, which is on the opposite coast on the Sea of Japan. And it didn't get nailed by the, by the plume so much. But the mountains between Fukushima Prefecture and Niigata are contaminated. And now their sediment in their rivers is loaded with radiation as well. Um, they're, um, <coughs> they're, the, the, in addition to the exposure people are picking up with their handheld inspectors and you know, the devices that guide your counters that people have, um, there's, there's also a lot of hot particle contamination where people have ingested the material. Um, we have cases where we have house dust that we're getting. People are sending us vacuum cleaner bags of, of dust. And uh, uh, one of the bags, which was examined over in England, it was uh, 100,000 centigrade emissions per second in, in a two pound bag of dust. And that goes on, of course, for, you know, for centuries. So the Japanese sleep on the floor. So the dust that's on the floor is in their lungs. And, and I am at the, based on my experiences from uh, I think over the next 30 or 40 years, see a million cancers as a result. I understand that that's an extreme view, um, but uh, when you look at Steve Wing's work at, at TMI, um, I, and I extrapolate linearly from that, um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of cancers. Right now we see a, a, an enormous, in Fukushima Prefecture, 40% um, of, the, of the kids tested have thyroid nodules. The normal number is 1%. Thyroid nodules are a precursor for cancer. So we're at the beginning of that experience, and it's alienating um, women especially and causing Fukushima divorces. I could go on about this. We'll talk out in the hall. So you're saying that I can, at some point in the future, begin buying fruits and vegetables from California because over time the current level yeah. of radiation will be not Now we're at a point in the U.S. Uh, I'm, um, Seattle and uh, especially Seattle, as far north as Vancouver and as far south as Portland, uh, got nailed in March and April. <coughs> and we've got good science behind that. Uh, we had air filters out in Seattle in March and in April, and uh, they're called CAMS, continuous air monitors. Essentially, you pull air through a cigarette filter. And then every day you take that filter out, put a new one in. And then you roll the filter out and put it in a, um, um, you, you lay it on an x-ray film. And uh, the people in Seattle wound up, and the rate at which the air filter was pulling air in was uh, 10 cubic meters a day, which is about what your lungs breathe. And we were finding 10 hot particles a day from Fukushima Daiichi during March and April for Seattle. So yes, Seattle got nailed um, nowhere near what the Japanese got. Maybe a thousand times less, um, but um, but at this point, you know, it's washed into the soil, and I'm not worried about what's coming from terrestrial sources here in the states anymore. I'm I'm very worried about the uh, top of the line, uh, top of the food chain, fish, 
that are in the Pacific. And I don't think that's peaked yet. Well, thank you to Kanat and 